Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. We are very excited and very proud, very honored today to have President of the PGA of America, Susie Whaley, on the call this morning. She, uh, of course, needs no introduction. She's an LPGA member and a PGA member as well. Ms. Whaley, thank you very, very much for being here this morning. Good morning. Hi, good morning, and good morning to everybody listening. I, I love this. It feels like at least we can connect, albeit technology-wise, but this is great. Thanks for doing it. No, oh, thank you very much for being on. Now, just so everyone knows on the on the call, there is no PowerPoint presentation for this morning's uh, call. This is an interview with Susie Whaley. Uh, and if you're looking at the PGA logo on a desktop, you are definitely in the catalyst. Uh, we just won't be proceeding from that page with any PowerPoint. Uh, we're going to remain on that page the entire presentation, and it'll just be a uh, candid interview with uh, with our national president. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to shoot in. We have a, we have a bunch of questions to, to go through. I'm sure everybody's uh, uh, very excited to hear your take on a lot of stuff. We've got a lot of things going on on the national level um, that, of course, affects us here on the, the sectional level for Southern California. Um, I'll jump right in there if, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Okay, excellent. All right, first question, do you think as an industry we should focus more on bringing new golfers to the game or retaining those we already have in front of us? You know, I really think it's both. Uh, you know, our core customer certainly is typically our best customer, those that we already have, and how do we get them to play more golf or enjoy their experience more? And then certainly we are always steadfast on introducing new people to the game, making sure the funnel is as wide as possible, making sure that it's in, as inclusive as possible and that we're inviting all to the game. You know, I think we would all agree that we need our golf courses to look more like the communities we serve. And we just got some new data out from the National Golf Foundation a couple of days ago, but the numbers are good. And, you know, are they good enough for us as PJ professionals? Would we want more? I, I think we would. Um, but at the end of the day, we have about 24 million golfers. We had about 33.5% in total participation, which would include off-course off, uh, sites as well, like Top Golf, for example, um, that, that's included in those numbers. But I think really the, the even more important fact for the question you asked me is, is 2.6 million uh, new golfers played the game uh, last year in 2018 for the first time. And, and of that number, about 31% were women and about 26% were non-Caucasian. And, you know, certainly uh, our board wants that to be way higher than that. Um, but we're excited about the growth uh, in women's golf uh, and the growth in non-Caucasian golf. And, and the data points to the fact that our PGA professionals in Southern California and in our other 40 sections around the country uh, continue to strive for that and continue to work extremely hard on a daily basis to ensure that not only we're bringing new people into the game, but that we're retaining those that have been in the game in a way that offers them a great experience. Now, uh, kind of a segue into uh, PGA.coach. I mean, obviously, it's a great new tool. Can you tell us uh, more about it, and a little bit about its inception and what your vision is for it? Well, I'm really excited about PGA.coach, um, realizing that many of you on the call uh, have been involved in instruction as well. I coach full-time. I'm the director of instruction at the Country Club at Mearsall and then for Susie Whaley Golf. And so I'm really passionate of, about coaching, obviously. But PGA.coach was really built with the intent of not only providing our PGA professionals as many resources and tools as possible, certainly not telling them uh, the methodology they need to teach by, um, but giving them tools uh, that made it easier for them not only to attract consumers, um, but to develop their curriculums and their programs in a way um, that really was based on lifelong learning and the seven stages of learning for the American development model. So PGA.coach is really a training program that professionals can go through to learn those stages if they're not familiar with them, uh, to get accustomed with how that would fit into the programming they choose to do at their facilities. And then to offer through the app that we have lesson plans and curriculum plans and, and resource tools and 
um, scientific research, uh, and any, anything we can possibly provide to make a PGA professional's world a little easier, um, to help them uh, be at literally the highest skill level they choose to be, um, and to be able to then mentor those coaches that are coming uh, in their program with them uh, to develop really lifelong golfers uh, through this program. We've had great, great success so far with PGA professionals around the country completing this certification program. And once you complete PGA.coach, uh, you then will get the access to the app, which, as I said earlier, um, offers tons of resource and information and lesson plans um, that you can choose to use or, or not use, um, but they're pretty simple to use. We use them here at Mirasol. Um, I've really loved it on a personal level and, and look for your feedback for those of you listening that have gone through it um, so that we can continue to make it better for you. And where do you see the most opportunity for growth in our industry in the next 10 years? Well, I think that's across all levels. You know, I, we've been talking about growing the women's game since I became a member. They've been talking about it far before then. Um, when I became a member in 2001, you know, we've heard it over and over again that the women's market is a market that is, is um, really low in our numbers in our industry. And that's, that's fact. Um, but we are making intentional efforts to change that. Um, we are, I think there's a huge amount of growth possible in that demographic, uh, especially because so many of our professionals now are offering um, many more opportunities to play the game, uh, whether it's just putting in the evening with their families and looking at that as a golf experience, whether it's playing three holes or nine holes, um, or whether it's the 18 hole traditional round and, and competitive golf uh, for women. But it's the intentional invitation um, that really we've, we've tried very hard to talk about and publicize because all of us as PGA professionals, um, I think, are incredibly welcoming to the consumers that walk through our doors. And so we continue to say, well, you need to welcome women. And I always say, I, I think our PGA professionals are welcoming women. I, I think we're perhaps, at least I know for me and, and where we've fallen short at our facilities, is actually making the intentional invite, uh, sending out a note directly to them saying, you know, you are invited to join us at the XYZ event. Um, and we've had much more opportunity and traction doing that uh, amongst that demographic than we have just saying, you know, we welcome you. Uh, it seems to be working for us and we're excited about that, but certainly I think that's an enormous opportunity for growth. I think in the senior market, there's a huge opportunity for growth. We have so many people coming into the game um, that are over the age of 60, um, that are looking for the opportunity to be healthy and well on the golf course, uh, to get out with friends, to socialize, to make uh, new friends, and uh, developing opportunities for them off of um, areas and yardages at your facilities that are, is appropriate for their strength level, um, as well as uh, for their athleticism, it is really important. And you know, I don't think we do enough in that respect as far as tee boxes are concerned. I think we have, you know, many facilities now have five or six tee boxes um, at their facilities. Some only have three, for example. But for those that have five, um, many of those were built and designed uh, not for seniors and, and not for women or, or youth. And I, I don't think it's acceptable anymore to have one tee box at the forward tee box at, at 5,200 yards or 5,100 yards. I think our facilities must, absolutely must have tee boxes at 4,600 yards so that as somebody progresses through the game or as somebody comes into the game as, as they get older, um, they have a next step and a next place to go. You know, if you're a young male, you can start from the black and go to the blue, go to the white, go to the green, and then go to the red. You have, you have five opportunities to stay within the game, and, and we only give one for those that start from the forward tee. Um, so I think we have great opportunity to change that as PGA professionals to advocate at our facilities to our boards uh, so that they understand that people are living longer, that we have an opportunity to retain members longer and retain customers longer if we give them an opportunity to play in an area that accommodates them. And, you know, putting two tee boxes in the fairway is, is okay, but I can tell you from experience, uh, many people understand that that's an afterthought. Um, a good one, but an afterthought, and, and I think we have to change that um, as a group. And then certainly inclusion, um, we have just an enormous opportunity amongst the Latino population, uh, African Americans, uh, any other diverse culture to introduce them not only to the game as members, 
which we which we, sh we are doing and need to continue to focus on, but also to the game as fans and then to the game as suppliers uh, and in the workforce. And you know we've done that with our PGA Works and and PGA Lead program, but we need to do more because those demographics uh, really this is an 84 billion dollar industry. Um, and that many are unaware of that they are welcome to be part of that workforce. And if we can have more people looking uh, like their communities, uh, working in the game, playing the game, being members at the PGA of America, um, more, they're more apt to come and participate in the game. Uh, so we have, we have so much opportunity and so much to do and so many skilled and talented PGA professionals leading the helm to do it that, that I'm extremely encouraged, but this is a group effort and it has to be a concerted group effort where all of us together are working toward that same goal. Well, clearly player development is a, uh, a focus and a staple of your administration. Why is player development so important to you? You know, I, I think like everybody on the call, I got into the game because I loved it. I loved it as a game. I was introduced to it by a PGA professional who made golf fun. Uh, I loved playing with my family. I loved meeting new people. Um, and I love having an activity that I can do uh, for a lifetime. So for me, sharing that passion with others is something I've always been committed to. Um, I think I get great joy out of having someone who's never picked up a golf club uh, get it in the air for the first time, as I do from teaching a, a tour player. And uh, for me, uh, I go home with joy at night if I can change somebody's life uh, by introducing them to the game of golf. So. I think all of us inherently have that within our bones. Uh, we wouldn't be PGA professionals if we didn't. Um, it's our mission at the PGA of America, not only to serve uh, all of you that are on the call and all those around the country that are PGA professionals and that are working outside the country, but you know, growing the game, uh, evolving the game, ensuring that, that we make the game the best experience possible for as long as possible is something I believe is my job, uh, but I love doing it. Now you talked a little bit about the underrepresented groups. What are uh, three recommendations that you have to get the underrepresented groups more involved in golf? Yeah, I think the first one probably is what I already just talked about is, is we have to make, we have to stop talking about giving more, more opportunities to play from shorter yardages and we have to start doing something about it. Um, I think we currently at the PGA of America, we are now talking with uh, eight municipalities around the country where we are hoping to partner with them to rebuild uh, golf courses that have become downtrodden and in communities that desperately need a safe place for families and children and adults to participate in a healthy activity. And, and we're excited about that. And we hope that we continue to do that around the country as best we can. And then certainly, uh, you know, we're going to continue to promote uh, junior golf. Uh, junior golf, that's our next generation of players for all of us as customers and members at our facilities and excited about the growth in PGA Junior League, excited about drive, chip, and putt, um, but also looking towards, you know, maybe a family opportunity that the PGA of America can provide um, with a parent-child league, uh, a senior league, um, things, things that we know we do well as PGA professionals, but how can we get the word out on a national basis to get those people to you, to get those people to your business, to help you drive revenue to your facilities? I mean, they're all, that's all great and good, and, and we know we're doing it for the right reasons, but it's also for business reasons, and it's for revenue generation. Uh, for all of you and your families, and, and so we're constantly striving to find ways to to help help that uh, for those of you that choose to participate. Which you know certainly there's programming around the country that that people do that's incredible that it isn't coming out of national. Um, but we want to give everybody the opportunity that we are promoting you uh, and that we are doing everything we can to guide consumers to PGA professionals as their connection to the game. What is or what will the PGA do to promote the game to the older generation or to keep them playing as well as building new golfers and customers from that age base? Yeah, you know, we are looking right now at, at discussing having a senior league play just like we are for PGA Junior League. Um, we think it's a, as I said earlier, we think this is a huge demographic that uh, loves to be social, has the money to spend at this time in their lives um, and is looking to get outside and, and make sure that they continue in their communities in, in a way um, that makes them happy. 
You know, we also see many of our seniors uh, through our volunteer base at our championships, um, where we want to ensure that we're giving them an opportunity not only to be a volunteer at our championships, but if they don't play the game, how can we get them involved in the game in those local communities? And what are we doing to make sure that those volunteer databases that we have, that we're using in a way that's tangible to make that next step jump from volunteer, fan, love, love, love being outside, love being a part of the game, to actually being a participant in the game uh, on course. Um, and we see that as an opportunity as well. And then certainly family golf, uh, making sure that we are promoting the fact that you know, this is a, a lifetime generational game. Uh, very few sports are like that. Uh, inclusive of tennis, tennis tends to be harder on your joints, but we have a sport that a grandparent or a great grandparent can play with a grandchild. And we do need to do more to promote that um, to the world and on PSAs and, and our television ads. Um, and, and when we have that opportunity, uh, certainly we will take take that up. Costs to play golf and slow pace of play uh, seem to be two large deterrents to retention and growth of the game. What can our association do in regards to these two issues? Yeah, I mean, we have uh, pretty strong feelings about this, and, and me in particular, uh, because I, I endlessly read in the media, and I also hear from many of our professionals around the country um, when they're speaking or, or talking to others as well. It's, Golf is too hard. Golf takes too much time. Golf is too expensive. Um, we as a, a, a group need to make a concerted effort to change that dialogue and to change that rhetoric uh, because 76% of the golf courses in the United States are daily fee. Um, many that I speak to uh, really have no understanding of that that are consumers. Uh, their perception is that 76% of the courses are private and elite. Um, many consumers that I speak to think a round of golf costs $100, and you know we all know yes that is the case in, in many places. But the average 18-hole round of golf at a daily fee facility is $35, um, and I, I think that you know we have to get that message out. Um, most people can't go to a movie anymore after popcorn and a coke uh, for $30, uh, but we're offering an experience that, that can last if they so choose to have it last an afternoon, um, outside, uh, doing an activity that's, that's fun and, and healthy, um, for $35. But, but we must as PGA professionals, um, point that out. We, we, we have to start talking about the game in a way that's optimistic and bullish. Um, I hear professionals say, oh, I, I'm a golf pro. I, I don't play golf. You know, that has to stop. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to play the game, say, I can't wait to play my next round. Uh, but no, I didn't get a chance this week, but I can't wait for my next round. Um, you know, if you're not playing the game, uh, you know, we can't expect others to play the game. If you're not supporting your section, um, you know, shame on you, because as PGA professionals, it's, it's, our, it's our duty to play the game at a high level and to be proud of that and to get back to why we all became PGA professionals, because we love the game. And I, I really believe that we have a chance to, to change the dialogue um, if we all get on the same page and commit to playing more golf, commit to allowing our staff to play more golf, commit to talking about the game in a way um, that creates a, a, a welcoming atmosphere, not a it's too hard, it takes too long, and it's too expensive. I mean, if we said that to each other about something else, we, we probably wouldn't participate. And so I think it's our, it's our role and it's our opportunity to change that dialogue, and we can do that together. Now, uh, kind of a fun question here. What, uh, what does the Southern California section of the PGA need to do to help get a PGA championship out here to the West Coast? Well, I'm excited that we have two championships coming to the West Coast, albeit not in Southern Cal, <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, but we have one, for those that aren't aware, we have one at Harding Park in 2020, the PGA Championship, which is in San Francisco. And then we return back to the Bay Area in 2028 uh, for the PGA Championship at the Olympic Club. So, you know, I can tell you this, I can tell you that our board absolutely uh, understands the question. Uh, now that the date has moved to May, it certainly opened up far more opportunity uh, all over the country uh, to have the PGA Championship as well as the Ryder Cup. 
Um, and so, you know, you never know. I, I can't give you an actual date of when that would occur, but please know that your facilities are in the mix, that's for sure. Now, uh, the PGA show and, and most large trade shows seem to be losing steam and participation. What is the long-term outlook for, uh, for the PGA show? You know, I was at the show all week, and, you know, I, I, I disagree with that. It was truly an amazing show. Um, you know, we call it the major of the golf business, and literally we had over 40,000 golf industry professionals from all 50 states. Um, and also 89 countries, which was uh, really exciting. Um, you know, we have become a global show, uh, much more than just a domestic show. And we had almost a thousand exhibiting golf companies, uh, attracted about 7,500 PGA professionals from around the world. Um, you know, and so we we have so much education there and so many things to offer. Um, you know, we're we're still bullish on the golf show now totally realizing that there's a show on the West Coast that is provided that's amazing, um, as well as sections are doing some of their own shows. And then certainly with the advent of online purchasing, um, many, many people who perhaps only went to the trade show to do their buying or ordering or to seek out new products or hear about new products, much of that information uh, is online. And so we are constantly striving to ensure that we're offering opportunities at the golf show and that you may not be able to find anywhere else. Uh, so certainly our teaching and coaching summit is something that we're really proud of that's there. Our presenters and our speakers uh, that come and, and deliver content that are there. Um, exhibitors that perhaps, as I said earlier, you had never seen before or don't know anything about um, that we're bringing in. So we're trying to make sure, for instance, this year we had uh, the, the um, Innovation Center um, where we brought in 50 um, groups that had a new product and something a little bit like Shark Tank. Um, and we did our own virtual Shark Tank uh, right there on site where the winner of that was offered uh, booth space at the show. Um, so we're trying to come up with ways that would make it enticing and exciting for somebody to come uh, and have more than they could just see online or more than they could just see uh, locally uh, if they so choose to do that. Now, some associates and members are under the opinion that the association doesn't do enough to validate their dues or haven't done enough to further their careers or improve their livelihood. What would you say to that opinion? Oh, nobody thinks that in Southern California, do they? <laughs> oh, not in this section, certainly not myself, but uh, um, uh, <laughs> hypothetically speaking, of course. Yeah, it's the first time I've ever heard that question. Um, you know, I, I'm so excited and, and thrilled about many of the member benefits we have. And, and to your point, a lot of professionals are unaware of, of some of the things that they receive as a part of, of being a member. Certainly, first and foremost, everything they get from the Southern California PGA locally, which you're doing an amazing job there. I, you know, I get your magazine. I follow most everything that you do there. And I would say the majority of sections copy it because it's so strong. Um, as far as sex, as far as national dues, which you know have not risen in years at a hundred dollars, um, I can certainly share with you from a national level uh, what we feel are the benefits that we're offering for that a hundred dollars. So, you know, many of you may be aware or may not be aware, we have 19 PGA career consultants around the country who really offer their expertise to help any PGA professional with their leadership skills, business acumen, resume building. Um, anything to do with employment, um, we offer that to you uh, and, and really believe that that number may possibly grow in the future as, as they are really doing incredible work for our PGA professionals. Our member championships, our tournament play, as I spoke to a little bit earlier, really proud of that, that our PGA members have the opportunity to compete in numerous tournaments um, throughout the country on some of the best golf courses in the world. We have the upcoming PGA professional championship as an example. Uh, in Belfair, in Hilton Head Island that's coming up where we'll have 20 PGA professionals uh, earn the opportunity to play in the PGA Championship at Bethpage, and, and that's incredibly exciting. And um, we have complimentary access, uh, as many of you are aware, to uh, all the majors on the tours, uh, inclusive of in a couple weeks uh, at Augusta National. Um, and we offer that as a, as a part of that dues line. And we have our lifelong learning education plan, which, you know, for anybody that takes advantage of that, that library is incredibly um, robust uh, for a small fee. 
and excited to have the opportunity to provide that to our members, but as well as uh, opportunities to go online that do not does not cost money um, to advance uh, their education. Um, we have uh, the PGA Journeys campaign, which you'll see kicking in gear here now when uh, Augusta National starts and then into the PGA Championship where we're highlighting PGA professionals from around the country and their journeys in the game and in employment to really showcase to the world who PGA professionals are, uh, what we do, and the benefit that we serve to the facilities uh, where we are employed. So excited about that. We have a member assistance program, a MAP program. Many of you may have that through your workplace or your facilities, but for those of you that don't, that is inclusive uh, in your dues line, um, where you get support uh, if you're struggling uh, with anything, whether you're struggling uh, with family issues or uh, work-related issues or health issues. Uh, we have a 24-hour support line there for you where you can speak to counselors um, and hopefully get the help uh, that you need. And that would be inclusive of your families as well. Uh, PGA Disaster Relief Fund is a part of that. Um, we distributed $557,000 to PGA members in 2018 fiscal year, uh, the second largest distribution ever, disbursement ever, um, which was coming right off of behind uh, Hurricane Katrina. Uh, Perk Spot, if you're not signed up for Perk Spot, we have almost 7,500 PGA professionals signed up for Perk Spot. You'll find that on PGA.org if you don't know about it. Um, we have uh, numerous vendors that offer PGA of America professionals and their families the opportunity for multiple discounts, places like Target, Home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, you can go online, FTD. Um, it's numerous, uh, the amount of discounts that you have uh, on that site. Um, I am personally use it all the time, uh, especially when I'm sending thank yous uh, to around the country. Um, and I've saved uh, an amazing amount of money. My husband laughs though, because he says I buy so much on it, I'm probably not really saving, but um, it is a savings. And it's something that if you're not active on Perk Spot, I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, we have our new partnership with Cadillac and Top Golf. Um, you know, we've given sections the opportunities to participate in, in car deals on their own, as well as have a national sponsor now in Cadillac, which we're looking to roll out a member opportunity within the next year for Cadillac. Uh, Top Golf, we have a partnership with Top Golf for your national dues, where you get 50% off, which is good Monday through Friday, uh, excuse me, Monday through Thursday um, for a bay at Top Golf, if you if you weren't around, aware of that. Um, KitchenAid, obviously one of our big partners for the KitchenAid Senior PGA Championship. We have multiple discounts for KitchenAid, and, and KitchenAid is our biggest. Uh, we have 15,000 PGA professionals signed up um, for the KitchenAid discount program, again, on, on PGA.org. Um, you know, it, there, there's so much um, that you can take advantage of uh, as far as benefits are concerned, but it's really up to the PGA professional um, which benefits they find uh, that are uh, really of value to them. But, you know, I think as a board, uh, we are extremely proud of the fact that over the course of the last six years, every opportunity that we've done a partnership with has to include a member discount, a member benefit um, for us to proceed forward with that. Um, that's a, in inclusive of section benefits that we offer through our partnerships. And we're we are committed to that. We will continue uh, to do that. And um, we're proud of what we're currently offering for your national dues. I know you touched on uh, a little bit about Perk Spot, but uh, what could Perk Spot mean to the PGA professional and their families? You know, I, we, we haven't, we've only done it for about a year where we're tracking. And I think the average save for purchases that you would already consume is at about $2,600 a year. Wow. Um, well, I personally was not aware of that uh, uh, myself. Considering the recent Ryder Cup captain selection of Steve Stricker, what is the method used to appoint the captain each time? Yeah, many of you probably know we had the, you know, Ryder Cup task force. We now have a Ryder Cup committee. Uh, I sit on that committee with Jim Richardson, our vice president, and Seth Waugh, our CEO. Um, and then we have three tour players sitting on that committee. And uh, out of that group, uh, the decision is made about who will be the next captain. Um, and we were 
thrilled to say that Steve was the unanimous choice for the Ryder Cup at Whistling Straits. Uh, he is a, um, a Wisconsin boy, we called it. And I went out there with him to make the announcement. Uh, and he just, he was just overwhelmed with emotion. It, it meant the world to him that he was chosen. He, um, we know, will be incredibly prepared uh, for the event. He's already made strides to uh, get in touch with, uh, he's made one announcement on his assistant uh, captain, which is Jim Furyk. Um, we made some tweaks to the Ryder Club selections uh, based on Steve's feedback and, and the committee's feedback. And, you know, we're going to put us in, put ourselves in the best position uh, for success uh, for 2020 in, uh, in Kohler. You've done an incredible job becoming the first female president of the PGA. Why do you think there are not any other female PGA members on the national board? You know, I think for us, I'm, I'm super, well, we have another female on the board. Her name is Andrea Smith, but to your point, she's not a PGA professional. And, you know, I'm excited about how many more females are earning and receiving and becoming elected, uh, not only on committees and on their local boards and their sections, but as officers of their sections. And previously, many of our board members would come through uh, the officer ranks. And many at the time, over the course of the last 10 years, we didn't have a lot of women who were officers in sections or who had participated on their section boards. And what's encouraging now is, you know, not only through PGA lead, but through other women who, Didi Moridiati, for example, who's in Northern Cal, you know, we have, we have women now in those roles. Uh, women are seeing, young professionals are seeing women uh, as role models and as leaders and looking at it as an opportunity to have a voice in the room. And I think it starts really, uh, at least for me, it did. It just started at the committee level uh, locally in my Connecticut section, and, and I loved being a part of that. The people I met, um, the networking I had the opportunity to do, the mentors who helped me in my career and, and taught me and, and I learned from. Um, and it just kind of uh, organically for me morphed into something I really enjoyed doing. And, and I see that happening uh, for many more women, and I'm encouraged. You know, my hope is, uh, you know, within the next 10 years' time, there'll be more women uh, on the board of directors. And, and really, first and foremost, though, and I, I say this all the time, you know, I see myself first as a PGA professional and, and one that's qualified and one that's proud of their body of work. And I think there's men and women that are PGA professionals that feel the same way. So I encourage anybody who wants to be involved in governance, who hasn't had a chance yet to serve on a committee or or to be a part of uh, the board or part of the chapter or part of the section, um, to go ahead and, and, and take that risk. Go ahead and, and step out of your comfort zone a little bit and, and offer a little bit of time um, because what I've received back from it is far greater than, than I could ever possibly give, and I think you'll feel the same way. Is there an old guard in the PGA, and to be successful, do we need a new one? I think we are successful now, and I and I think we have more to do. Uh, we can't be Pollyanna. We can't sit around and, and, and think uh, we're doing a great job. We have done some great things, uh, but we have our challenges set out in front of us. And I think, you know, over the course of time and of history, no matter what business entity you're a part of, um, you have to evolve. And so for us, um, you know, calling it an old guard, I would say that the, the people that were in governance were making decisions for the time that they were in and making the best possible decisions that they could. Uh, we feel the same way currently as a board. Uh, 10 years from now, uh, you know, in the future, we're trying to make decisions for 10 years from now, uh, not for today when we're in that boardroom. We're trying to be strategic. We're trying to foresee, you know, what are the things that, that we need to have in place to have the strongest and most vibrant PGA membership? In 10 years' time, what do our members need? Uh, what are they going to be looking for? And what are consumers going to be looking for? And how are they going to see us um, as PGA professionals? Will they look to us first? Or are there others that they'll look to for instruction or facility management? And we want to make sure that we're ahead of that. So I think the term that I would use is, you know, that anybody that's held office, been in governance, uh, volunteered their time, uh, does so with the best absolute intent of moving the game and the membership forward. Uh, we feel that same way, but we will continue to be progressive uh, in how we do it 
and we have to be progressive in how we do it if we are going to attract consumers in the future. What do you want your legacy to be? Yeah, I get asked that so often, and, and I mean this sincerely. It's not one person's uh, legacy. It is, uh, for us, it's a team effort. I'm a coach. I've been involved in the boardroom since 2010, with the exception of 2014. I had come off the board in 13 and, and was campaigning in 2014. But there are things that we put in place in, in 2011 that are just coming to fruition now. There are things that uh, President Sprague put in place that, that won't come into to, to play for two years from now. Uh, same with Paul Levy, uh, same with me. Uh, some things that, that I may get an accolade for, somebody else uh, before me and a board before me is who put those wheels in motion. So for us, it's, it's more about, uh, as I said before, it's, it's how do I leave the game better than I found it? Uh, how do I ensure that the members who do what I do on a daily basis, which is be a really proud PGA professional, who work long hours, who are trying to take care of their families just as I do, how, how can we make their lives a little better? How can we make sure we're providing what they need to be successful? How can we give them every resource and tool um, possible that they get to choose uh, what they find value in and, and what, what they to have them progress within their careers? That to me, uh, if, if we put those things in place and, and if I can leave um, the Office of President knowing that we did everything we could to make that happen, whether it actually came to fruition during those two years or will after, um, then that will make me incredibly proud. What are you most proud of professionally? Well, that's a, you know, that's a really hard question. I, I think I'm most proud of professionally um, probably PGA Junior League Golf. I was the National Player Devel Junior Development Chair um, when we began our discussions about having a team golf program. And I think right now um, that is something that I think uh, has really made great strides in growing the game amongst youth who perhaps golf wasn't in their future. Perhaps it wasn't something that their families did. It wasn't something they would have been introduced to. It wasn't something they would have found great joy out of. Um, and that when we made it a team and uniforms and, and not as individuals so that they could participate, even if their first sport was something else and feel great about it, and then have the game for a lifetime, um, professionally, that's what makes me most proud is when we can have a youth, uh, uh, an adult, uh, bring somebody back in to the game and, and allow them to enjoy it uh, for their whole life. So that, that's what makes me the most happy and the most proud. Now, I, we, we talked about this before the uh, interview started um, about, you know, I just can't imagine how busy you, you must be. I mean, as a, as a teacher, as a speaker, as a, PG, as a PGA president, as a mentor, and of course, as a mother, how do you find balance in your life to not become overwhelmed? Yeah, you know, I, I do actually a keynote um, that's called There's No Such Thing as Work-Life Balance. <laughs> because for me, um, I think if we all, if we strive to have this perfection of balance, you know, we probably will let ourselves down when we get home at night. And I'm not willing to do that. So the way I look at everything that I try to accomplish in a day and everybody on the phone who's just as busy as I am tries to do in a day, um, I, I try to be where I am in the moment that I'm there. So if I'm at the Country Club at Mirrors Ball and, and my day is packed full of instruction, um, I am where my feet are. I am 100% committed to that person that's standing in front of me for the time that they're standing in front of me until the next person comes. I'm I'm not thinking about PGA of America business. I'm trying very hard to stay in, in the role I'm in at the time. Um, I, I block out time to do the PGA of America business as best I can uh, without interference from uh, my workplace, which is here at Mirasol right now in season. Um, as far as, uh, for example, two weeks ago, I hosted my very first uh, Division I collegiate women's event in Casa de Campo for 15 Division I teams. Um, which, yes, was a, a huge undertaking, but an incredible uh, opportunity to give back to women's golf on a venue that they typically don't get to play, 
which was the teeth of the dog. And when I was working on that, um, that was my focus. And I would spend the, that time working on that. I do get up extremely early. I get up between 4.30 and 5 o'clock uh, every day because I love to work out. I, I like to stay fit and healthy. And, and that's the way I can do it. Um, it's not for everybody, but that's the way I manage it. I try to get a couple hours of work done for PGA emails and, and other in the morning before I get to work. Um, and then in the evenings is typically when I'll do media interviews, um, webinars, uh, uh, presentations, um, where I'm focused just on those. And then uh, as far as my, my schedules and keynotes and, and travel, um, you know, those are things that I have to figure out what, when, when I can write those and, and um, really kind of navigate that in a way that makes sense for, for my jobs, um, but also for my joy. And I, and I get great joy out of spending time um, with people and, and sharing with them what we do as PGA professionals, but also sharing the game with them. Uh, so for me, it's, it's not always perfect, and, and that's okay. Um, you know, you, you spread yourself thin, uh, and the only way I've managed to be able to try to strive for excellence in each thing I do is to make sure when I'm doing it, I'm focused on it. I'm focused on that uh, first and foremost. And uh, my family is an incredible support system to me. They put up with a lot. <laughs> my children are older. They're 24 and 21. Uh, they understand my commitments and responsibilities, and they give me a lot of leeway. Um, which I'm so grateful and thankful for. I've been married for 27 years to a PGA professional, and I'm thankful for that um, because he understands the commitments uh, that I face, but I also understand how hard he works uh, within the business. So it's a great partnership. I think I just have super support systems, and, and I love what I do, uh, and that makes a difference for me. Fantastic. You bring a fresh perspective to the role as president of the association. In your opinion, where has the association really succeeded in the last 10 years? Well, there's so many great answers to that, and there's so many people to credit that were involved in, in some of those uh, opportunities. You know, Tom Addis, first and foremost, being one of those who's just implemented so many unbelievable uh, opportunities within the Southern Cal PGA section coming off as national president and then diving in locally and, and sharing his expertise and ability to create programming and, and, and member benefit models and partner models um, that hadn't been seen before. So, you know, we have to give credit to, to the section executive directors who are, are working incredibly hard to make sure our members have what they need. Um, and that they're providing things that are new as well and progressive. Uh, so I think that's been an amazing uh, transformation in the last 10 years. Our tournaments and our championships, our television deals and our digital rights, which give us the opportunity to do everything we do um, at the section level and for our members have certainly transformed over the course of the last 10 years with our Ryder Cup deal, um, obviously, and our, our just recent PGA championship deal where where we have revenues that, that we can, based on tax law and what we can and can't do, um, provide uh, what this association uh, should be providing uh, to our members as we move forward. One of those things would be a digital platform in 2020 that will those that have been on PGA.coach will now be able to talk directly to consumers, almost like uh, Open Table for Restaurants does where we're actually going to send uh, com consumers to PGA professionals through a digital platform. Um, that costs money, obviously, but we have the opportunity to provide that because we feel as an association, we need to make those connections as best we can for PGA professionals in a local market um, beyond what they've already outreached to. Um, junior golf uh, certainly is incredible. Our education platform, our employment services have morphed into an unbelievable a uh, subset and opportunity for our PGA professionals where we are now going to go into the employment space and, and really uh, compete uh, with headhunters and other companies that have really taken the lead from us. Uh, we want to take that back uh, because we believe that PGA professionals, the best, serve, best person served to run a facility, whether it's as an executive manager, uh, whether it's as the director of golf or head golf professional, or whether it's as the director of instruction or, or teaching professional. Um, and we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to, to have the PGA of America at the table uh, during those hiring decisions at the facilities where we believe our professionals want to be. So, you know, there's just so many answers to that, and I'm sure I forgot a million of them. But um, at the end of the day, um, you know, we are here, our governance model, our leaders, our board of directors, my fellow officers, Jim Richardson and John Linder, um, 
every day, I, I can't convey it strongly enough, every day the PGA members are first and foremost in our minds. I wake up thinking about it. I go to sleep thinking about it, as does the rest of my team that's on the board. And, you know, there are times where you may disagree with the decision that we've made, um, but please know that decision was vetted and discussed and, and not everybody in the room, we, we, we go back and forth. It's not just this, this uh, one thought minded place. It's, it's an incredible place with amazingly bright PGA professionals who are really advocating uh, on both sides of the coin all the time. Uh, and when we come up with a decision, we come out as a team. Um, but please know uh, those decisions are solely based around how we can benefit you. Well, similar to our uh, our greatest successes in the last 10 years, what do you think our greatest opportunities for improvement are? You know, the game does not look like our communities, and uh, we need to offer the opportunity for youth that's disadvantaged to get on golf courses. We need to offer the opportunity to uh, public golf courses to bring in consumers in a way that's tangible for them uh, so that they can build their base and increase their revenues. Um, we, we have to increase the inclusiveness of our association in three distinct areas amongst our membership, amongst our suppliers at our championships events and amongst our, work, our workforce. Um, we're on it, we're doing it, but it is challenging and it is something we have to tackle if we are going to be relevant uh, working into the next 10 years. Well, very good, Susie. We really appreciate your time this morning. We know we can't imagine how busy you must be and for you to carve out a little time to, uh, to speak to our section. Um, is tremendous and, and we're extremely honored and extremely flattered for your time this morning. For everybody on the Catalyst call, as usual, the quiz and the YouTube recording of this morning's broadcast will be going out shortly uh, in an email. Please take the quiz and return it to Sharon Kerfman at uh, skerfman at pgahq.com. A score of 70% or higher will earn one MSR credit for attending this morning's Catalyst. I want to thank uh, Susie Whaley one more time for uh, for being on our catalyst. Thank you very much. And uh, one thing that, uh, uh, as we were talking about uh, female representation on the national board level, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of this, Susie, we actually have two females on our section board, Allison Kurt and uh, Kim uh, Valcone. So uh, we uh, we could take a lot of pride in in being uh, innovators on that front. But uh, um, Thank you very much for your time. Everybody, thank you very much for being on the call this morning. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.